The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. My name's Arthur. Thank you for joining me as we share together Proverbs chapter 10, verse 15. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. Solomon was a man who was a king in Jerusalem, fabulously rich, but he was a keen observer of everything around him. He was a keen observer of nature and understood about plants and animals. He was the one who really established the first university city in the world, for people came from many places to learn Solomon's wisdom. And of course it wasn't just him, he set the model for people to inquire about the nature of things. And he was the leader among those things. But as people around him studied and shared their insights with him, so he increased in his own understanding and wisdom. For if you're in an environment where there's a spirit of inquiry, then you're encouraged to participate in that and to increase in your own wisdom and understanding as well. Solomon was also watched society and people as much as he looked at plants and animals. And the book of Proverbs tells us his insights into society and the way people act and behave. And it soon becomes very plain that in society you have rich and you have poor. And the rich men tend to get richer and the poor men get poorer. Which was why God established a rule that every 50 years the rich should give away the riches that they had acquired back to the original owners. And the poor who had sold themselves to slavery, though who had sold their lands and property, could go back and reclaim them again, so that there was an evening out again, rather than a perpetual accumulation of wealth in the hands of some, that the poor might have hope and may not lose hope. Because the destruction of the poor is their poverty, Solomon says. Now, the rich man, once you get a little bit ahead, then you have resources to get further ahead. And you have a large degree of control over your circumstances. So the rich man's wealth is his strong city. It is his security. It is his protection. And that principle works through today. We take out insurance policies. If we're rich enough to afford the premiums, then we insure our future. We make a strong city for ourselves. We take out superannuation. Our whole society believes in this principle and encourages us to take out superannuation to insure the future, even insuring our death so that we can pay our funeral bills after we've gone. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. Well, that's Western society, but many parts of the world, large parts of the, of the population, are extremely poor. Nevertheless, even in those societies, you have the rich as well as the poor. I've been to Bangladesh a few times, one of the poorest countries on earth in terms of per capita income, no social security as we are familiar with, and there you have the extremes of wealth and poverty. Some individuals living in very large and magnificent compounds with many servants and the majority of the people living in very humble circumstances. Uh, One room in an apartment block with shared facilities or living in villages made out of thatch with a bit of plastic to stop the wind, thatch on the roof, extremely poor. What do the poor do to work? They cut down bits of bamboo and weave them into baskets and sell them for a very small amount of money. Sweep the streets. Smash bricks to make aggregate. The wealthier ones can buy a rickshaw and spend their day riding it around, carrying other people around the city. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. So this is why Solomon urges people to work hard because the only way that you get wealth and keep wealth is by diligence in harvest. You take the opportunities that you have 
And, of course, you also need wisdom and understanding. The way to lift the social standing of a community is through education. Knowledge leads to understanding. Understanding leads to wisdom. And it applies in all levels. It can apply in a specialist area like medicine or engineering. But it also applies just in a more broad sense. If you are able to read, if you are able to do maths well, then you can run a small business. Then you can build up that business. And so a rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. But as riches increase, so people turn away from God and rely on their own resources. It's one thing to have riches, but other scriptures warn us against relying on our riches. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The riches have a tendency to take wings like a bird and fly away. For when we have accumulated riches, then we need a strong city to protect them, because there are others out there who will seek to steal them from us, maybe by violence, maybe by subterfuge. And so the proverb is not saying that riches is necessarily a good idea, but one needs a level of income and opportunity to survive. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. Those who are poor have little opportunity to get themselves out of their poverty. It keeps them in there, because they must spend all their time just doing menial work. And this is one of the injustices of society. The rich man can set the wages for the poor man. And unless there is love in his heart, he will give the poor just the bare necessities to keep him alive to do the task that he needs to do. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. There are two circumstances by which people may be poor. There are those who are poor because of their own actions. They had opportunity to study, to work, but they did not take it. There are those who are poor because they were born into poverty. They were born into circumstances where there was little opportunity. And the tendency of society is to keep people in that situation. Those who are rich tend to think that the poor do not deserve anything. That's why they're poor. This was formally stated within Hinduism where the rich were considered to be a higher caste of people, a higher class of people than the poor. And the poor are poor because they failed to live appropriately in a former life. Poverty is seen then as a judgment on them. The really poor were not even fit to have a cup of tea in the tea shop. Solomon is looking at this just from the world's perspective, and it is a pretty glum story. But the gospel seeks to redeem the poor from destruction. When Jesus was invited to read the scripture in the synagogue in Nazareth, he read from Isaiah the following words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. For God has a better plan. When men came to follow the Lord Jesus, he said to them, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay down his head. He came to us as a poor man, poor in the material things of this world, when he needed a coin to pay a temple tax, a half shekel. He had to send Peter fishing to go and get one. When there was this discussion about Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus didn't have to pay taxes because at that stage he had no income. He had to say to the people, well, show me some of the tax money. And they showed him a denarius. We're told that Jesus humbled himself to become a man, to become a servant, not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. He humbled himself and became obedient even to death on the cross. But God has now highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name to redeem the poor to everlasting 
life.